again. I'm Helen Sea with MTV's independent special, My Province, My Country. Tonight, Edwin Fidelis takes us to the New Guinea Islands region. Sir Polius Matane is a teacher by profession who became an author and wrote a series of books about his life experiences and travel adventures to other parts of the world. Not only that, he was appointed as PNG's ambassador to the United States of America in 1975, shortly after PNG gained independence. In 2012, Sir Paulius Matane was appointed as PNG's eighth governor general. In this interview conducted earlier, Sir Paulius Matane gave his views on Papua New Guinea and how much the country had achieved as an independent nation. When we gained our political independence in 1975, you asked me where I was, and I, let me tell you this. I was um, back in, in our, some schools in Papua New Guinea. Um, I became a, a school teacher first, and later on, not very long after that, I became a school inspector in charge of all schools in certain areas of our country. But at that time, um, I was a representative of our country in the United States of America. I was uh, there to represent our country and at the same time to educate a big number of uh, people in the whole of the United States of America on the possibilities of uh, having proper investment in our country because our country, as we all know, is pretty rich in natural resources. We have got practically everything here that people would need to have in order to develop uh, their businesses uh, so that they can make some money and at the same time help our country to develop economically, socially, and even politically. So I had to go to the United States at that time when we gained our political independence and I had no uh, <clears throat> no feeling of sadness that I was sent for the first time as a, a first Papua New Guinean um, representative of our country in that most p powerful na nation at the time in the whole world. And I thoroughly enjoyed that with uh, my staff, my family members, and other people who were with us. And as from now, we will be counted among the family of nations. We have talked about this day, we have planned for it, worked for it, and look forward to it. I know that every man, woman, and child of our new nation shares this moment of pride and happiness with one heart to join in celebrating our independence. Two things I can remember, but there could be many others. The first is that many of us did not know what independence was all about. And why should we celebrate? because we did not um, understand it. That's the first thing. And for the other thing, a lot of people really look forward to something different because many of them thought that if we continue to have our political independence, then we, will, we would be able to take over the properties that the, the foreigners had in our beautiful country. And they were happy that we could, we could be politically independent. But at the same time, uh, many of us did not even know at the time how to run businesses, to use our natural resources for the benefits of our, economic benefits of our people. I knew him because we went to school together at Sugeri. Uh, not the primary education, but we were together. We were together there uh, to to study together uh, uh, something that would be able to help us to uh, become leaders of our country. And Sir Michael was with, with with me, and there were many many other people. And uh, we did a lot of work there just to make sure that uh, what we learned would be able to help us to develop our country politically, economically, socially, and a lot of other, other things as well. People of Papua New Guinea, it gives me the greatest pleasure to address you all this Christmas. 
Well, I was not sure why I was uh, elected by the national parliament so that I would become the governor general of Papua New Guinea. But I was happy because I believed at the time, and I still believe today, that I, uh, I know a fair bit about things that our country needed at the time, our, uh, our relationship with other countries, uh, beginning in Australia and New Zealand and other places in, in, uh, in Asia like uh, Malaysia and Thailand, Thailand and up to Japan and uh, China in particular that we moved to the West to India and a lot of other places in Europe and in Africa and at the same time a lot of places in North and South America. I thought that I did reasonably well to represent our country as our rep representatives in outside Papua New Guinea and as well as in Europe, uh, the United States of America and so forth. I think I'm qualified to say this because I've been to all the seven continents on earth, all of them. We, we have some difficulties here. We should concentrate more on learning how to become uh, developed in our ways of life. We have to do this because, because if we cannot do it, who will do it for us? If we are an independent country and now we have an uh, anniversary of our political independence, are we truly independent? Are we truly developing our nation so that each of us, all over the whole country of Papua New Guinea, are we developing? Uh, properly, so that the kind of thinking that the many of us had in the past, 40 years ago, will be seen as reality, that we are truly independent in that sense. I think when you look at a lot of things today, things are not going the way that they should. Uh, there is a lot of corruption going on in this country. And unfortunately, many of our uh, big people are involved in, in political corruption. It's very sad. And how could people do anything like this to have more money, money in their pockets when Many of the people who voted for them do not have anything much in their pocket also. We have a big problem here. So our first uh, priority to do here in Papua New Guinea is that we should concentrate on developing our own resources and slow down bringing people from outside to come and develop our natural resources because when they develop our natural resources, they take their money away from us. We have to learn this and we have to do the real development by ourselves. And a good way to do this is that we have to work very hard to learn how to do things for ourselves, like developing our, our, our rural areas, to, to develop our own, our own resources. And now, I, I'm very sad to say this. I'm seeing a lot more and more people from outside who came to our country to make use of our resources here for development so that they can make plenty of money for themselves. And what do they do with the money? They take the money away from us to their own countries. I'm asking all our leaders these days, please make sure that we do the right things only and we have to train our people to think positively about life. At the moment, many of us are not thinking positively about life. Many of us think positively about things that will assist us individually but not the community. We have to think about the community as well as the people of Papua New Guinea. And I think if you do this, we will go a long way in some areas of our responsibilities. 
we cannot do more development here unless every one of us understands what development is all about. We have to do this one for ourselves in Papua New Guinea, not for anybody from outside. Those people have their own countries and they have their own natural resources. But we can get one thing from them, and that is uh, experiences in developing our rural areas. And if we can do this, then we have something to work towards. But if we don't do it, we will sit here for a long time and other people will come develop our natural resources for their own benefits. My hope is that, and before I say this, let me tell all of you here today. This country of ours is truly blessed with our rich natural resources. Truly blessed. We have got everything here on the land, under the land, on the sea and under the sea also. We have got everything here that we could develop ourselves for our own benefits. And I think if you understand this, then we move on to learn more about how to develop our own natural resources and not to wait for any, any, many people from outside to come and do it because if they come, they develop and they take the money away. And this is not good enough for a country that has been um, <clears throat> uh, an independent country for the last 40 years. I would like us from now on to think more positively about the things that we have here because those things we have are very good for our own benefits if we develop them ourselves. At the moment we have got very good schools here, technical schools, colleges, universities, and they learn about these things. But the question is, are we practicing those things that we learn in our schools so that we can benefit from the, from the things that we develop with our own hands and our, using our own minds and our own hearts? Um, the way I, th I see is things this, these days, we are m moving backward. I'm sorry to say this, but I've lived for a long time. Some of you may not realize it, but I have lived for many, many years. And I think I will live for a lot more years yet. But I would like to live for more years yet when I see the people of my beautiful country, Papua New Guinea, which I represented uh, overseas for many, many years, to develop uh, <clears throat> peacefully, politically, economically, socially, and all the good things for the benefits of our own people first. Welcome back. If there's any place in the world that people use animal instincts to detect danger, it will have to be the Matupit people of East New Britain province. Although the Rabaul Volcanological Observatory provides volcano and earthquake related information to the people in disaster prone areas in the province, the Matupit people claimed they depend on their natural surroundings, such as observing weather patterns, animal behavior, or earth tremors to detect danger. It's traditional knowledge passed on for many generations, something that is very Papua New Guinean and remains largely undocumented. The Rabaul Volcanological Observatory in East New Britain province has had a significant impact on the province over the last three decades. Volcano-related information about the warnings prior to a volcanic eruption and when to evacuate people from the danger zones is relayed from this center. But obtaining those volcano data relies on modern sophisticated equipment placed at strategic locations around a volcano to monitor its activities at real time. But over the years there's been a remarkable experience shared by the Matupit people, a group of people who inhabits most of the areas situated at the foot of the Tavurvur volcano. Matupit Island has been rendered a dangerous place to live in. The island of about 4,000 men, women and children is located within a caldera and surrounded by two active volcanoes. Despite the ever-present risk of volcanic eruption, the people still remained on the island. 
But what's outstanding about the Matupit people is their ability to detect danger prior to a volcanic eruption using animal instincts and the environment around them. The eruption that took place. Johnson Penil, a village elder on Matupit Island, tells me it is an ancestral knowledge retold over many generations. He says they are taught about how to read weather patterns, sea level, earthquakes and behaviors of animals in the village. Well, you talking about some, uh, <coughs> suppose you like feeling kind kind of earthquake, like a plutonic uh, earthquake that comes from beneath the ground and, <coughs> and comes up towards the surface of the ground. That's going to cause an eruption somehow. So this is a story of like uh, man. He says old people in the village used to tell them myths and legends too about Kaya, the spirit inhabiting the volcanoes, and the time intervals of every major eruptions. So side the tumbo na yet, only talk about by in up to 50 years, and then na melo this la time we play start by it's been the 94 eruption and 20. 25, 24 to 25 years. Only start talking about We did another 50 years time, and one plan, Mount Pablo, you fly it. This, this generation. Now, Toblo only been through. On the 19th of September 1994, as the country was coming to the end of the 19th independence anniversary celebrations, the Wurwur and Vulcan volcanoes erupted and devastated Rabaul town and its surrounding areas. Geophysical researches carried out after the eruptions have indicated that the Matupit people were the first to evacuate their homes a few hours before the initial eruption. Although there were reports of disaster alerts being issued by the Rabaul Volcanological Observatory a few hours earlier, the Matupit people claimed they were the group of people who woke up the entire residents of Rabaul town and set evacuation into motion when everyone was asleep and were not worried about the earthquakes that preceded the eruptions. During the 1994 eruption, there was uh, about 24 hours of uh, you know, continuous uh, earthquake shaking. And so I think uh, that uh, the remark about uh, the Matupit Islanders uh, sort of evacuating uh, a bit earlier than other people uh, was based on uh, their experience uh, from the 37 eruption using those uh, animal uh, instincts where they think uh, if the birds are flying away there's a sign that something uh, the volcano may, uh, may erupt and so they use that uh, information to try and uh, move out uh, and if, they, if that was the case uh, that happened then it was based on uh, that and so uh, that is uh, like, a, like they say, say uh, you know knowledge are uh, passed down from the uh, uh, previous uh, generations to the newer generations uh, generations uh, about that uh, usage of uh, animal uh, movements to uh, warn them that something may happen so they sort of uh, start moving to. So now when public long town now they look at me people and people walk about. Now they only thing all the thing all the say so all the, all the talk also hey also when them now all money walk walk about there. <coughs> all all two all throng all no survey authority not been talk about long this a lot too by something going to happen. So only 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 Kerem no good as well, me plan, me plan say in town too as well. No moving out of people. So they look only look at me plan. They only start behind me plan now. The two volcanoes aren't giving off emissions like before, but volcanologists say that doesn't make it any safer. Today vegetation has returned covering the once barren land on the island and the Matupit people continue to live their lives oblivious to the recent past. Numerous attempts by the provincial government to have them relocated were unsuccessful because they keep coming back. It's only a quarter of the people, population of Matupit, all of in block and cover secret. But three quarters of the uh, population, people are here to stop yet long palace. You know, got ground yet. Uh, government, you know, are questioning people here long, some like block or kind of thing. Up until now, the awareness of the science and the dangers of volcanoes may not be appealing to the Matupit people. Many of them have become accustomed to the way of life here, a life that resonates with nature and one that is not much talked about publicly and remained largely untold.
Kaunas, a small island province, had been featured prominently in recent years in PNG's political arena. The establishment of the Asylum Regional Processing Centre at Lombrum attracted debates here and abroad. But the small island province of about 50,000 people has its own backlog of problems to deal with. Lack of service delivery reaching remote islands and climate change remains a harsh reality for this island province. Loringau town, ideal, peaceful and laid-back, is the provincial capital of Manus. The province has a total population of about 50,000 men, women and children. The province is made up of many smaller islands and for the people, their only means of reaching the town is by boat. Manus has a long rich history of war, cargo cult movements and seafarers who travelled longer distances by sea to trade with other coastal villages. But it is a province that is still struggling with the delivery of basic services. Developments reaching this part of the country have been a slow and painful experience for the people here. Education, health and road infrastructures continue to deteriorate over the years. But low side the development and many looking plenty of work come up. You know that. And we'll kind of say one play like we'll put it one play and walk it. He like come up by is a guy to kind of talk about some issues come up low side low, especially low bami to cause them all low one. Development by can come up. But successive PNG governments have provided some hints of political will and support to the province. Two of its political leaders are members of the current PNG government. Manusi, in all same before. Like before in the one and place that like, as a school or eight post or kind of same um in all same before. Manus now plenty place inside the like inside the big bush the manus or or little island or scattered island outside that like development them start or development in terms of education or kind of same. Okay, how sick this la two um, inside the all Remote areas for manus too, you got all house stuff, but the problem is like um, plenty of facilities are more random. But the issues of development are not the only problems facing this island province and its people. On the outer islands, there is a severe problem. The island province comprises archipelagos that are filling the pinch of the rising sea level that has changed most of the landscape of low-lying islands. We can recall him the side of Lambis and Lugos and the NBC and all that. And before, he, he kind of some 10 to 15 meters, he go, he go under the salt water, right? mm -hmm. ground being stopped. But now, so she may recall him back long, the look, look long landmark being stopped before. It got big like Seni Sigama. NBC, for that matter, Pasem, he been stuck long way through. I mean, landmark been stuck all the time over there. But now I come over the close to the big road with all car all over there. So this little look, he may look more some sea level rise. I mean, he got big like impact long passing long Bagarab will come up inside all place. The government's plans and strategies to address climate change impacts in coastal communities around the country appears to be so far from reality in this part of the country. And the march talked about reforestation, reducing carbon emission and building seawalls are now at the mercy of nature.
In the coming years, the people in many coastal villages in Manus will have to be relocated. Much of their relocations are not certain. Relocating people would mean negotiating with other traditional landowners who for the most part may not be willing to give up their land. We believe all all the pine big la heavy uh, Planting all island way close to big class. No good only got all families long all line long all inside law. All seven dollar big class, but can help him along. Move him all come up, now every set of all can long. All place we only all got all family long. Now so much all line will knock at all knock at all one top long and now means I think no good government by pine road long help him all now every set of all law all mainly manus kind of stuff. But the impacts of climate change are not the only problems facing the Manus people. Since 2013, the establishment of the Australian-run Regional Processing Centre at Lombrum has brought in refugees from other countries after the PNG government agreed to assist Australia in detaining and processing refugees who originated from Middle East countries. The processing facility has since drawn international attention to Papua New Guinea particularly Manus. But yeah, time only come, let me, let me talk also, plan the man only got personal view long all along, only talk, come long only, he good plan, some plan, plan the only talk, he no good, yes. He no can warm the sun in by come up, and by the sun in by good plan, so no can. Development supposed to come inside the place, he's a good plan, he's a no good plan, no can. So likewise, all asylum seekers, time only, kissing all kind Manus. He got good plan and no good long, come long on to. In 2017, the processing facility was forced to close following a Supreme Court decision which ruled the detention of asylum seekers illegal. About 500 refugees have been moved from the defunct facility at Lombrum to an alternative location in Lorengau and still waiting to be awarded a permanent residency. We have about 500 plus refugees still in Manus. Uh, they are part of the community and they contribute to the economy of, of the province. So far we have about um, 100 plus refugees have already uh, resettled in the U.S. and uh, we are expecting more to go. So, uh, you know, the Assam Sinkers uh, will still uh, will remain in the country until the two governments, the government of Papua New Guinea, the government of Australia, you know, come up with a solution to resettle them at the third country. Manus may have been the first province in Papua New Guinea to take in a bulk of people from different nationalities who arrived as refugees. For now, the province is going through a transitional period. Issues of interracial marriage between local women and the refugees have increased over the last three years. Children are fathered by asylum seekers who have now resettled in other parts of the world and many of the local people are worried about the future of the province. All asylum seekers say, all plenty of people, they run with them all marry Manus too, and some people got picking his staff and all this like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but come along, all people say, they got big like impact on side long um, development. I'm only moved to go back. I'm not going to go back. It's normal. I'm not going to go back. 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 New Ireland province, we focus on Lihir Island. Like any other resourceful area in Papua New Guinea, the small island has its own social and economic challenges spurred by the mine. The landowners want to make sure their younger generations are self-reliant and prosperous after mining activities end on the island. <laughs> Lihir is one of the larger islands in the New Island archipelagos. The island, located in the Namatanai district, is the home of one of Papua New Guinea's largest gold mines. 
Census estimates have put the total population of Liir and its nearby islands at around 18,000 men, women and children. In the last 20 years, the growth in the mining sector on the island has fueled an increase in the number of people who chose to come and live here. But this development has come with new challenges for these island people. The once subsistence farming supplemented by cash crops like cocoa as means of income gradually declined in popularity when mining came. When the mineral exploration began on the island in the late 80s, it led many people to believe that their future share of development could be found through various forms in terms of land compensation, services and infrastructure delivered by the companies who will be using their customary land. To look at the funding to fund all these services. It has to be funding that comes from the government, from all levels of government, and the funding also will come from the mining developer developer and, we, and then from compensation itself for us. So those three, three agreements are captured in, in, in the IBP to play a role in creating development on near and making it sustainable. Since the mine came into operation between 1995 and 1997, the landowners have been caught in a series of tussle over benefits derived from the operators of the mine. This led to the establishment of the Lihir Mining Area Landowners Association, or LAMALA, an association that represents landowning clans regarding spin-off benefits obtained from the mining project. We, we knew from the very beginning, when we negotiated the project, that mining resource is a non-renewable resource. It will one day be de depleted. So therefore, we um, structured our IBP in a way that we, after the mining finishes, we will, have, we will be able to create a sustainable future for our people. The coming of the mine was a relief to the people of Lihir as it appears to solve most of their problems socially and economically. The custodians of the land have received their equal share of benefits in terms of royalties, services and infrastructures. And after more than 20 years of mining operations, the life of the people here has changed in a very big way. Uh, when, when you look at the scenario that is happening uh, uh, right now on Lihir, um, what we have in place now is a, a system that uh, we have basically signed up with the, with the developer and every benefit that we are receiving from the project or from the developer is all good at this, this point in time. When the the project closes, that's the that's the, the that's the very very big question that we need to to answer. Lihir has a long rich history from customary beliefs to the era of the neo-colonial rule and the first mining expedition on the island. Their involvement in churches and culture is one that they have refused to give away easily to the outside influence. Most of their sacred grounds still remained largely untouched. Village elders who were part of the mining agreement from the very beginning have seen the need to preserve them for their future generations. So as a landowner, I can feel I feel comfortable today, but I also know that um, in the future, when the mine goes, there will be uh, a question for me to answer. Not for me only, but I will have grandchildren, I will have um, bubus that will be coming up. So uh, whatever we do today, we need to make sure that we need to plan the right foundation today so that if the mine closes, at least we have something uh, to leave for our, our kids in the, in, in the future. The legacies of mining activities, the pollution to the environment or the improvements in standard of living have been retold time and again in many resourceful areas of the country. One such were the legacies of the 20 years of mining operations on Mishima Island in the Milan Bay province. Over the years, Mishima has been featured prominently in most of the landowners' discussions as an example of a mining activity that left little for the landowners. That is Liri Sawe, this is the situation in Misima. At the same time, mining is 
He not been got good to sit down long on the ground. All people no miss him. Sit down long all. He not been got sustainability, development inside the community. This is a little sour long on. A few years after mining activities ended on Mishima Island, socio-economic standards of the people dropped significantly. Infrastructures have crumbled and the way of life returned to what it was 20 years ago before the mine came. This place was a mining center where everything was fine, everything looks beautiful here, the buildings. And after the mine left, and what you can see now have tend to be West are uh, being destroyed by people. So when the man was here, all the buildings was good and they looked fine. It was a very beautiful place with uh, good houses. And even this house here was a very good house where all the workers come and meet. But after the man left, you can see for, uh, for many years now, you can see uh, how this house is now. After all. But for the Lihir people, Misima provides a contrast and a lesson for the people to learn from. Our leaders, you know, like him, this la situation by Kama of Lihir. Long life, long on Papa ground na on people of Lihir. Lihir has been embarking on plans to chart a new future for themselves in the years to come. The landowners say they will make sure Lihir won't go down the same path as Misima. We had a vision that one day, after when the mine is gone, we should be able to create a, a non-mining economy, which, is, which can sustain the livelihood of our people. The Lihir people believe they are on the right path towards achieving the Lihir destiny, a devised concept for the people that centers around sustainability. It is a concept that they carried on with them from the past, and believe it will work. And the plan itself, the, uh, it has a vision and it has a, a, a destiny. So th that is why uh, it is now referred to as the Lear Destiny. And the Lear Destiny is to create a, um, a non-mining economy after the mine closes. We know that the uh, mining uh, revenue will cease when the mine operation stops and therefore we have to create something sustainable. Bougainville is currently conducting elections for representatives in the autonomous region. In the coming weeks, declarations will be made, but one person that stands out in the autonomous region is John Momis. He has been an influential leader in the early days of PNG's independence to Bougainville's aspirations to be an independent nation. Uh, the first thing uh, we must appreciate is the fact that our leader then, Chief uh, Michael Somare, uh, expressed a vision that many, many Papua New Guineans had, that one day we would be free. Whether we were free or not, in practical terms, really didn't matter. What matters is that our belief that man has a right to self-determination. Self so Michael Somari took a firm stand and people rallied around him and I was one of the ones who rallied around him and said whether we are ready or not we will be ready we will take the necessary steps to be ready so uh, we supported him and we did take the step to uh, uh, mobilize the people of Papua New Guinea and one of the most effective ways of mobilizing them was to set up the Constitutional Planning Committee which traveled the length and breadth of PNG at the time. 
and adopted a completely different strategy of getting people's views. We did not ask them uh, whether they, what sort of government they wanted. We asked them questions uh, and they answered questions and from the answers we uh, figured that they wanted a government that represented them and a government that uh, they would uh, elect and the government that would be in the final analys analysis be answerable to them. And, and that is why uh, we set up, you know, committees all over the place, you know, it was very difficult but we did it. Uh, people gave their views and from their views we figured out what kind of government they wanted. And one of the things that came out, came, uh, became very clear was that uh, they wanted to preserve Papua New Guinea's uh, unique cultural background. We, we came from different uh, tribal language groups. PNG is a highly diversified country. And so we figured out what they wanted was not uniformity. What they wanted was a community that would uh, preserve the diversity. And that is why we, one of the things we recommended from the very beginning was a decentralized form of government to give the people in the provinces the power and the right to determine the kind of development they wanted and so on and so forth but of course within the parameters of the nation. So that's, that's why I think uh, uh, Sir Michael Sumari, Michael Sumari then succeeded in mobilizing uh, the, you know, the, the, you know, uh, the, the, the people of Papua New Guinea who were so, so uh, different and yet who wanted to take control of their own affairs. My message to the people of Papua New Guinea uh, in respect of Bougainville's uh, case is that we have to implement the Bougainville Peace Agreement. All the hard thinking was done during the, pe during the time we negotiated the peace agreement. Now the next phase is to implement the peace agreement. Uh, if we don't implement the peace agreement, then we will have wasted all those years of hard work that uh, both the national government and the people of Bougainville, elected leaders, ex-combatants, or MAMA, everybody, uh, worked so hard to adopt as the strategy we must follow to reach a good, good outcome. And the good outcome would be a peaceful outcome. Of course, it has to be a negotiated outcome. You know, we may have all our uh, different views on what the outcome should be, but as per the peace agreement, it, has to be, it will have to be a negotiated outcome. As uh, one of the founding fathers of the Papua New Guinea's independence, I want to uh, say uh, to the people of Papua New Guinea that uh, we should take ownership of this independence. We should now work to respect uh, one another and work as a as a united people uh, in a community that will bring uh, equitable distribution of services, equitable distribution of power uh, through the decentralization process, maybe greater devolution to the provinces uh, so that the provinces then will accept the responsibility to, to manage their own affairs. And I think that in itself is something that uh, despite our uh, our lack of lack of uh, capital lack of intellectual capital and other things that's one thing that Papua New Guineans have we are proud of who we are and uh, we will work together to uphold the principles of uh, the national goals and directive principles you know which are very very important which set which set the vision of this country. Uh, I played a very important role in that. In fact, I introduced the National Goals and Directive Principles 
which are so important, which make PNG constitution so different from many other constitutions. Uh, so uh, Papua New Guineans are lucky, their rights are protected, and uh, we should be we should accept the responsibility to respect the rights of other others and work as uh, proud members of a, of a country that uh, uh, is uh, endowed with the rich resources and uh, provide, uh, sorry, and, and uh, seek help in terms of education, technology and so on and so forth to take control of our own destiny. I, I think independence means uh, creating a sense of interdependence in a community that works for the same goal. So Papua New Guineans, uh, I want to wish you great success in the future and my firm belief that it is the people who make a nation and not the structures and uh, policies. It is the people who are actually responsible for maintaining unity, but the unity must be uh, a kind of unity that is found in a, in a community, not regimentation or uniformity, and that's what PNG is because it's a highly diversified country. And that brings My Province, My Country special independence series to an end. From the entire MTV team right across PNG, happy independence.